Good morning from the land down under, Melbourne, Australia. Brothers and sisters, so glad to see you this morning. <clears throat> Let me take a quick drink here. Oh my goodness. Do we have a bunch of things to cover this morning? And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I had, I, we're, we're going to discuss a few things. <clears throat> Sorry. I guess I should have cleared my throat before I started, but I was so excited to be able to come on. Ah, made it, Sister Paulette. So glad you're here. All right. I had another rapture dream last night. And I want to start by talking about, now I'm not going to go in depth because actually the point of this is to show how things that happen in our life, <clears throat> how they tend to point to, uh, you know, instances where or at least I, I can say this from, from my specific standpoint. <clears throat> um, next time, remind me to get like a, maybe a cough drop or something before I get on. So, Steve, it's a pleasure to meet you here. Uh, everybody, come on in. Here's what I want to talk about is, is how things tend to point um, to biblical events, right? How our lives, how things that happen in our lives actually have, uh, at least from a personal standpoint, prophetic significance. I mean, so, so by that I mean, uh, we see how things that are happening in the world today, how they actually point to we see prophecy unfolding, right? So it's already pointed in, in the Bible. And, uh, but it's actual events that's occurring on a global scale. But it can be things that happen on an individual scale as well to help to show you personally, I believe, just how close things are or maybe God himself might be trying to make a point to you personally, or maybe uh, like through the giving of rapture dreams and things like that, or people being left behind, they're having visions and stuff, all of those kinds of things that are happening to people personally, but it's meant to be given because uh, it's that close, I believe, to the harpazo of the bride taking place. I, oh my goodness, I just believe that we are so close. We are so close to this happening now that 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 I am just expecting it any moment, any moment. I truly, truly am any moment. Okay, so. Before we start, let's let's say a quick prayer here because I want to say the things that the Holy Spirit wants everyone to hear. All right, Abba, our Heavenly Father, we just lift you up, we praise you, we adore you, we honor you, we worship you. You are worthy to receive all of our glory, honor, praise, and above all worship. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We love you, Jesus, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And for anyone, including myself, that has not been able to do that, I'm asking for you to give me the ability to do that. I want to love you with everything in me. I want your brothers and sisters to love you with everything in them. And I'm asking for you to fill us with you, Holy Spirit, so that we might do that. Draw us to yourself. Oh, how prophetic is that? Draw us to yourself 
that we might be in your presence forevermore. Draw those to you that are going to be part of the family now through this message and through your word, most of all. Uh, your word is truth. And Lord, let the truth come to all of us and let it be open to all of us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, oh, yes. I Look, last night I had, and this happens to me sometimes, I had, I had gotten very, very tired. And this happens sometimes, though, I feel this intense tiredness that will come over me. And uh, now, <clears throat> I didn't think much about it because I had actually been working very, very hard. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm also thinking that itchy nose, maybe somebody's going to come visit me. Hey, how about Jesus? Um, but let's, so what I'm, what I'm thinking is that, you know, I just really need to go to bed early because I had been nonstop working all day. Now in within that, so here's the same type of thing. And this is just kind of an aside. Because we are going to be discussing this from the standpoint of Mary and Martha a little bit later on down the line. But how Martha, she is busy, focused, and distracted on working. Mary is at the feet of Jesus. And one of the things that we I'm going to point out about there is how we need to be able to do both. But the most important of those things is Jesus, Jesus first, and then the things next, the serving next. OK, so this is what uh, what I'm what I have happened to me. So during this entire day, I was intensely working. But at the same time, in the midst of all of that attempts, I'm praying, I'm including Jesus, I'm inviting him to be a part of every single moment of my day, especially in that intense moment of effort, right? He's got to be first in all of this. But I was very tired. And 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 I it's one of those where I'm thinking, I've got no choice. I've got to lay down. I've got to sleep. And so this is really what happens. Sometimes when this happens, it's the Lord wanting to show me something that has happened a lot in my life. And um, I find that it was actually no different here. But I was, I, I felt it was a little strange because it was it was early. It was for me, I, you know, it was only nine o'clock. And so what I did is I, I just told my wife, uh, I said, you know, baby, I, I've just got to lay down. I am zonked. And so I do need to, to go to sleep right now. So she said, OK, that's fine. And and so I did. Well, here's what happened, though. I went almost immediately to sleep. It's one of those things where it's just like, bang, wow. You went in <clears throat> and, uh, and I had fallen asleep. Well, what happened when I fell asleep? Well, I had a rapture dream. And what's interesting about this rapture dream, so I'm not going to go into all of the details, because like I said, I've got a lot to cover today. But it's, it's very important with all of these connections that you're going to see. In this rapture dream, I was actually dreaming about this rapture dream within my dream. So a dream within a dream. OK, so you understand that I understood that I was laying down and I was going to sleep and I was dreaming and I was dreaming of in the dream about a rapture event. And if Jesus was there and Jesus was speaking to me 
And he was explaining to me about how this was just about to happen. And he was saying, be ready now. This is going to happen right now. And he was walking me through the steps. And I know this was Jesus, right? So it's a, I know this is Jesus. I'm, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You know? And so he's he's leading me through this. And he's saying, okay, get ready. It's going to happen now. And then I hear this loud trumpet sound in the dream within the dream. So then I wake up with to the dream, if, if that makes sense, if you understand where I'm going here. From the dream within the dream, I wake up because of the sound of the trumpet to where then I wake up in the dream and where I'm still dreaming. And then in that dream, I'm saying like, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The rapture is about to take place any moment. And then from that point, then I wake up to conscious, uh, you know, uh, uh, consciousness to where I'm actually physically awake. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, <laughs> wow. And then I start praying about it. And, I, and I'm thinking, Jesus. I need confirmation of this. I really need confirmation of this because I, it was so different for me to this, the rapture within the rapture, you, you get it? So I was just like, that was really different for me. And so I did not want to go anywhere or think anything about this until I had a confirmation. And so I prayed about it and I'm saying, Jesus, please, 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 I need confirmation that this is from you. I do not in any way want to be, uh, you know, distracted, deceived, or uh, in any way uh, try to see this as being something else other than from what you are trying to show me. So I, I do uh, pray about that, and then I go back to sleep. And then, brothers and sisters, I have exactly the very same dream within the dream with Jesus there. It was all exactly the same. And oh, oh, I just, I can't contain myself because it was so exciting. So what happens then when I, I have then the, the trumpet blast goes off and then I am, uh, 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 the trumpet blast goes off and I wake with inside the dream again. So I'm still dreaming. And in this dream, then suddenly I'm saying it's happening now. And then I hear this loud boom. And then I woke up in, you know, actually physically conscious. And I immediately look at the clock and it's 1141. Brothers and sisters, we had an earthquake this morning at 1141 PM. That, that, that was what happened. At 11.41 p.m., I awake from this the second time. I have got to tell you about this because it all relates, okay? Let me start with a verse so that we can kind of look at what happens and so I can tell you about this. Now, I want to tell you about the earthquake because now this, I really believe that it is symbolic of the resurrection. And we're going to show you that. But I didn't know about the earthquake until this morning when I wake up, okay? It's until I actually get up. First off, Genesis 41, verse 32. I'm reading out of the King James Bible. And this says, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God 
and God will shortly bring it to pass. Brothers and sisters, that's what I'm saying is the reason for that, I had the same dream twice. And, and I was just, when I got up this morning, I was just so excited. I was so excited. I knew, yes, yes, yes. I'm just like, da, 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 da. I am so excited. I still am. I still am. It was, I can't tell you just down inside of me, just how, how thrilled I am, how filled with anticipation and excitement I am. Let's get into then what happens this morning, okay? So I'm sitting here, I'm getting to, trying to get ready, trying to get ready, trying to get ready. And like I said, I'm so excited, but then suddenly, wait, check the time. What time can I, I'll just give you one guess as to what time it was. Because I'm thinking like, I'm running a little behind in trying to get ready. I'll show you. And you see that brothers and sisters? 726, 726, Harpazo. And I knew that that meant Harpazo immediately. I'm thinking like, oh, oh Jesus, you're sending me another message. That is a confirmation of a confirmation, right? Okay. It did not stop there. Then I, uh, with my uh, wife, at, as we're having uh, breakfast in the morning, and I'm telling her about, you know, we're, we're having our, our morning time together and, and uh, before she uh, leaves for work, and I am just about to um, tell her, and just so you know, it's like Monday here in Australia. So what, uh, what I'm saying is, did she, she says, oh, I just got a message. Did you know there was an earthquake last night? And I went, no, really? And I then looked it up, brothers and sisters, okay? So I'm like, I go, earthquake, earthquake. I had to find out about it. All right, so let me show you uh, just what happens with this. I'm gonna show you some more printouts because I had to take some shots of this, okay? And so this is what it happened. So actually, I'm got, uh, getting ready. Let me go ahead and show you this first. One, one, one. Oh, wait till you see, brothers and sisters, what I have for you here. Okay? So you can take a snapshot of this. Okay? All right. Now, let me explain to you what we have. I wanted to show you up at the top. It says 737 because that's what I was... This is just after I'm shown the time, 726, okay? So that was me to show you that. But I want you to notice a couple of things. I pop this up, buildings crack, roads buckle in magnitude, 3.8 Melbourne earthquake. Then it goes down, buildings crack, roads buckle in magnitude, 3.8 Melbourne earthquake. It's doubled. Right? Do you see that? And you'll notice what I have. I'm going at 3.8. Now that didn't sound like very strong, but here in Melbourne, where they're not expecting lots of earthquakes, that that's kind of a big deal. All right. And you'll not, and then, then I thought out 3.8. That's an 11. Wait a minute. 11, 11. There we got 11, 11. And then my eyes go down to what you see I've got circled there at the bottom left. 7.26 a.m. Harpazo, that's when this was first published, right? So that's, that's, that's when this is thing. So wait a minute, Harpazo, again, Harpazo, okay? So I went to try to find out 
some more about this, okay? Let me give you another one. Ready? Take a snapshot of this one. So let me see this. This was after the next one. This is at 742. So it's just a couple of minutes later. And I see, wait a minute, buildings crack, roads buckle in magnitude 3.8, Melbourne earthquake, right? And then right under that, damage reports come in in Melbourne as it's hit with a powerful 3.8 magnitude earthquake. So again, I see right above each other, 11, 11. And then I look down and my eyes get big and wide as I read that according to Geoscience Australia, the earthquake epicenter was at the Sunbury region in Glenvale about 30 kilometers north of the Melbourne CBD. That's the central business district is what they call that, the CBD. In Texas, we'd say that's downtown, okay? All right, so at a depth of three kilometers at a magnitude of 3.8, let me point out again, it occurred at 11.41 p.m., the very moment that I was awakened after the rapture trumpet. Do, do, you, do you hear what I'm saying? The rapture trumpet in my dream happens. I awake and look at the clock and it's 11.41 p.m. And I am stunned, brothers and sisters, stunned. Wait, not because of that, but because of what the earthquake represents. As many of you know, uh, that I was in another earthquake that was a 6.0 earthquake, and I was downtown or in the CBD. I was on the fifth story of, of the building where I was working at the time. And if you haven't heard that, I encourage you to, to, to listen to it because it was so pregnant with prophetic meaning uh, especially to me, and I told many of you about it. And so what, what I'm saying about this is the point is that when we have a resurrection, it is generally accompanied by what? By an earthquake. And this is what I see this as being the, that, that thing. And, and, and here's another thing. This happened right before midnight, right? Do you see that? At 11.41, in the 11th hour, that's when this happens. Don't you see that as yet maybe another thing? Because when are we thinking that Jesus is going to appear in the air? At the last moment, right? At the 11th hour, right before this happens, right? The, the midnight cry is going to go out and we are going to go up. The graves are going to be broken up just like it happened when Jesus was, uh, when he died on the cross, he's buried, he's resurrected. But at the same time, there's an earthquake. The rocks are rent, the graves are open. We see then that many of the saints arose and came out of their graves after the resurrection, okay? So that's that's what we see. I see this all again as that, and that I'm, oh, I'm still shaking. You, I hope you can probably tell that I am still shaken by it. If you pardon the pun, uh, earthquake shaken by. <laughs> okay, so uh, was a poet, didn't know it. Uh, but then I went one more. I'm thinking like this is this is unreal. This is unreal. So I looked for another one and I and I found it. And I want you to see it, brothers and sisters. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Sonic like boom awakes Melbourne residents. Oh, wait a minute. 
What's going to happen at that awakening blast? Do you see that? Do you see that? Awakes Melbourne residents as quake starts. There's the awakening blast, brothers and sisters. That's what I saw again. But then, but then, when was this article done? 7.26 a.m. first published. Harpazzo. Harpazzo. I don't know how many different ways that I can actually see Jesus going, Wayne, get the point, get the point. I'm going to, yep, I get the point. I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to tell everybody, okay? 726, Harpazzo. There's an awakening. <laughs> There's an awakening blast, an awakening boom. And I'm wondering how that that coincides with the blast I heard of the trumpet in my dream, and I wake up at that moment. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is about to call up his bride. He's about to call up his bride. I don't think we have any more time left. And I know that there are those that 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 still say, no, no, uh, I don't believe it. I don't want to. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraging you. I'm encouraging you. If, if you feel that way, if you believe, nope, it can't happen pre-trib and it, 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 it's got to happen uh, mid-trib or it's got to happen post-trib, I'm asking for you, please consider this. Please consider this. It's not just me. It's many people all over the world that have uh, been given dreams and prophecy according to Joel, Joel, okay? And, uh, and I just really see this, this, this really is the time. This, I, I feel it so deeply and in such, a, in such a way that you just can't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Am I, am I giving a date? No, no, I'm not. Am I expecting the event? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Now, brothers and sisters, let me go ahead and turn <clears throat> because there was so much that came, came to me, came to me. It, I started having scripture coming to me and then connections coming to me, and then connections with other parts of scripture. And I was just like, wow, wow, wow. Well, hold on. I can't give all of this to everyone. So let's actually, let, let me try to hone it down and focus in on just, hey, Brother Mike, Repo Man 64, everyone and say hi to Brother Mike. Uh, and I am so glad you're here, Brother Mike. Uh, it, it is, it's one of those things. I want to focus now and we're going to get into the word and we're going to get in deep. Okay. And we're going to start with, and I'm going to read chapter three of the book of Ruth. Now I've covered Ruth before and other people have too, but I'm going to cover this in some, hopefully some ways that you may not have seen before, but even I believe even more rapture connections that are about to take place. Ah, thank you, Baba. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read you this chapter, and then I'm going to go in deep, and we're going to look at these connections even, at, uh, even greater, okay? All right. <clears throat> There's a lot here, so let's get to it. So I'm going to read initially, I'm going to read the third chapter of Ruth out of the Amplified Bible. Now I'm going to do that first for a reason, because there are some, some nuggets of truth that I really want to draw out. Hey, you notice how I got that in there? You can just draw out those nuggets, okay? <clears throat> Draw out those nuggets about rapture. All right, so here we go. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, 
shall I not look for security in a home for you so that it may be well with you? Now, Boaz, <clears throat> excuse me, with wh whose maids you were working, is he not our relative? See now, he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. So wash and anoint yourself with olive oil and then put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. I want to highlight these little things. Go down to the threshing floor. There's a reason for every single word that's put in God's holy scripture, right? Every single word. So why would he say, go down to the threshing floor? We'll cover that, okay? Just hold on to that. Uh, uh, so wash yourself, anoint yourself with olive oil, then put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but stay out of the man's sight until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he is lying and go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what to do. Ruth answered her, I will do everything that you say. Where have we heard things like that before? Okay. So she went down, there we go again, to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had told her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was happy, he went to lie down at the end of the stack of grain. Then Ruth came secretly and uncovered his feet and lie down. In the middle of the night, the man was startled and he turned over and found a woman lying at his feet. So he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. Spread the hem of your garment over me, for you are a close relative and redeemer. Then he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made your last kindness better than the first. The last shall be first, first shall be last. Mm. For you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you whatever you ask. Since all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, I, I, I'm going to point out this little thing. Uh, highlight there. Know that you are a woman of excellence. There's going to be a reason I'll point that out. Highlight that. <clears throat> it is true that I am your close relative and redeemer. However, there is a relative closer to you than I. Spend the night here. And in the morning, if he will redeem you, fine, let him do it. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Lie down in green pastures. I keep having these connections. You'll see it all over. Verse 14. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but got up or arose secretly before anyone could recognize her. Boaz said, do not let it be known that the woman, highlight that, there's a change, came to the threshing floor last night. He also said, give me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. So Ruth held it and he measured out six measures of barley into it and placed it on her, and she went into the city. When she came home, her mother-in-law said, how did it go, my daughter? She said, uh, and Ruth told her everything that the man had done for her. She said, he gave me the six measures of barley, and he said to me, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Sit and wait, my daughter, until you learn how this matter turns out. 
for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. All right. There are so, oh man, I, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, so much. Make sure that I do this. <clears throat> All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take these out of order because there are several things that I want to cover here. I want to focus first on Ruth chapter 3, verse 14, okay? And so let's read that verse again, and I'm going to really dig into this deep. So she lay at his feet until the morning but got up before anyone could recognize another. Boaz said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor last night. Okay, so several things I want to highlight here. One, she lay at his feet. And we're going to talk about laying at his feet because one of the connections that we have here is Mary and Martha yet another rapture connection. And it says that she lay at his feet until morning, but got up. But the actual word that is written there and is in the King James is arose. And so arose before anyone could recognize another, right? So, and, and, and so what do we have there? Arose, there's an ar ar arising there, and there's going to be another rapture connection there. And we see that is, uh, we see how Jesus also arose early in the morning. And no one recognized him. I thought that was very interesting as well. All right. And then uh, before anyone could recognize another, Boaz said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor last night. And I thought like, wait a minute, there's something very interesting there. Not that you, or not that a woman, but that the woman. There's a specific woman that he's he's talking about that came to the threshing floor, right? Secretly. All right. Uh, and then, of course, then we're going to go in to talk about the uh, six measures of barley and how that then also has a connection with the marriage of Cana and another drawing out. Okay, lots of rapture connections here. So let's go in there. All right. So what does Ruth chapter 3 verse 14 mean? Okay. All right. So we're going to start with that. And uh, okay. So first I want to show you about, all right, so let me start here. <clears throat> all right, this is out of uh, Bible Dictionary, okay? And, and they cover this because I think that there's some important points that we can get here. Following Naomi's instruction of Ruth chapter three, verse one through five, Ruth tracks down Boaz at the community threshing floor and asked him to marry her, Ruth, chapter 3, verse 6 through 9. Now, there's one thing that I really want to highlight about out of this. Ruth, as symbolic of the Gentile bride, goes to the Redeemer. The Redeemer doesn't come to her, right? We know in the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride, that we are called up. We go to meet Jesus in the air. We go to him. He does not come to us. I think that is a very big connection there, okay? All right, so, but there's so much more. All right, it's the middle of the night uh, of what we might have, excuse me, let me try this again. It's the middle of what might have been the last night processing the grain. And so which grain are we processing here? Barley, right? It's the first harvest and the barley is, is being winnowed, right? It's, it's being thrown up into the air and, uh, in, and the wind blows the chaff away and then the white pearls of the barley fall down, right? Okay, so it's all 
separated out the the it's cleaned and ready right uh and so that's what's happening but i want to point out it might have been the last night and how many connections do we have that jesus says that he is going to come on the last day now i'm not saying that this is that last day i just want to i want to highlight some connections right that these connections when you start getting into god's word that you start hearkening to other connections in god's word it's so multifaceted it's so multi-leveled there's no way for us to get to the depth and, and see the bottom of it it's infinitely deep but that's what we want to do it's the middle of what might have been the last night processing the barley and boaz and his servants spent the evening celebrating the completion of a successful harvest. Okay, now it's also another point. Boaz and his servants, but not Ruth, because Ruth is the bride. So in other words, Ruth is not the servants of Boaz. Okay, I want you to see that we're talking about more than one group here. Okay, I want you to see that. All right. And uh, the men are now scattered around the area, sleeping and protecting the newly winnowed grain. Now, it, here's another thing. What do we see? They are all sleeping. And but Ruth is awake. Right. Do you see that? She is awake. She's watching all of this. Remember that what happens is that Naomi tells Ruth to watch all of this. And when these things happen, then you do this and you go and you lie down at his feet, you see. So you wait until they're all asleep. And it just so happens everyone is asleep, but she the Gentile bride is not asleep. So what do we think about then? How about the 10 virgins or the bridesmaids? They're all asleep, right? But the bride is with the bridegroom. So here, Ruth is with Boaz, the redeemer, symbolic of the bridegroom, okay? So I just wanna continue that. Now, this is very interesting as I continue. Ruth has a high reputation in Bethlehem thanks to her arduous work and her devotion to her mother-in-law, and she needs to be careful to keep it. That's in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11. <clears throat> now, this is very interesting. The threshing floor is known for prostitution. And where do we get that? We get that out of Hosea chapter 9, verse 1. Now, let's quickly turn to that because I want you to see this. I want you to understand this. Harlotry, idolatry, adultery. You see those kinds of things, right? So the threshing floor was known for prostitution. So let's, in Hosea chapter 9, verse 1, and I'm going to read this again out of the Amplified Bible because I want to get the fullness that we can get out of this, okay? And it says, Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exaltation as do the pagan peoples. For you have played the prostitute, turning away from your God. You have loved prostitutes' earnings on every threshing floor, attributing the harvest to the Baals instead of to God. Oh, my goodness. That should really perk up your ears, brothers and sisters. Do you see that there's idolatry, prostitution? That's what they're talking about, how the threshing floor was used for prostitution. But here in this particular instance, this is one of the things that we want to do. We want to protect Ruth. 
We want to protect her reputation because she's not coming down there for that. She's coming to the Lord because she wants to be mayor, or excuse me, Boaz as a representative of the Lord Jesus, right? She wants to be with him. She wants to marry him. She wants to be united with him. She just doesn't want to play the prostitute, okay? All right. The threshing floor is known for prostitution, as we just pointed out. In addition, this is also very important. Ruth is a Moabitess. When the Israelites approached the eastern side of the Jordan River across, and this is another thing, ah, we're going to cover Jordan, descent, go down, all right? We're going to cover that. That's another connection. All right. Jordan River across from Jericho. The frightened Moabites sent their women to seduce the Israelite men, thus distracting them from war. The Israelites began worshiping the Moabites' gods. God punished the Israelites by killing masses of them in a plague, and that's in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 9. To make matters even more precarious, Boaz can't yet agree to marry Ruth. Now, this is different. There's a lot of connections here. This is different. She proposed because he is a relative of her late husband. She has asked him to marry her so that he can provide a son who can inherit her late husband's property and remove the shame from Naomi, who lost her husband and both sons. But Boaz knows of a nearer relation who has first right of refusal. That's in Ruth 3, verse 9 through 12 that we read earlier. Besides the fact that he is naturally protective of Ruth, that's in Ruth 2, verses 8 and 9, he will not risk harming her reputation by allowing others to think that they slept together. So Boaz tells Ruth to wait until early in the morning when the late night partiers will have fallen finally asleep and the way will be clear for her to return to Naomi's home in Bethlehem, which means house of bread, right? Without being recognized or accosted. We don't know who Boaz is talking to here. It may be a trusted servant, but it may be to himself. Then again, his statement may be an awkwardly translated warning to Ruth. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but uh, the, the big points that we want to see out of here, again, I want you to see Ruth came to Boaz. The Gentile bride is going to Jesus, right? And what's interesting is it's coming Everyone else is asleep, and I find it interesting. Now, this is this is done when nobody else sees, okay? And so that's where some people get this um, secret rapture uh, type of thing event, but I don't see that it's going to be secret in the sense that uh, that it was done without anybody knowing it because I think that we see in many different connections, there's going to be the church that is left behind. They are going to know. We see in 2 Kings chapter 2 that uh, Elisha definitely sees that Elijah was taken, you know, those kinds of things. We definitely see that uh, even Enoch, when you look at the book of Jubilees, we see that there were people that saw that, um, and that might be different though. That might be different. The interesting thing is that uh, in the book, and this is kind of an aside, I, I wasn't going to discuss this too much, but it, I find it very interesting. When we look at the book of Jubilees, which gives us a detailed account of the rapture of Enoch, okay? And there are many uh, men that went with him and they don't find either the men or him, uh, but they, uh, the other men, those that turned back, 
they knew that he was going to be taken to be with the Lord, right? That he was going to be taken by God. I don't know if that would be considered something secret or unseen. We know that the the in the second Kings chapter two, that the sons of the prophets stood afar off. And we don't know if they actually witnessed this or not, right? Uh, so uh, that they know that Elijah is gone, uh, but they want to go looking for him because they, they, you know, they don't have any, I don't think they actually believe that that was the case. And that's the same thing even with Enoch. Well, let's look under the stones of snow. Let's look under the snow, snow and see if they're there. They're maybe they died under this snow, but they don't find anybody there. But they looked. Anyway, so that's that's another thing. But secret in the sense that as she, the bride, is watching, she goes to him when the rest of the servants are sleeping. Uh, and, um, and, and then, of course, you know, she goes back. I mean, there's, there's other little things here. What we're trying to do is get the rapture connections, right? Okay, so that's what I want to do. She arose before anyone could recognize her, another, right? Recognize another. So in other words, you couldn't see each other. You couldn't recognize who another person was. It was uh, dark early in the morning. So it was still dark. Uh, and, um, but I think that there's something here. Do not, so this is what Boaz says, do not let it be known that the woman why are we saying that? Because uh, that it's, it, I think it relates to the fact, again, it is the bride. That there is the bride of Christ, right? And it is not a bride of Christ. It is the bride of Christ. And I think that that's really what it's hearkening to here. Okay. Uh, here's another part. Here's something else that I find interesting. Uh, that she lay at his feet until morning. Okay. Um, let me, b before I get off all into that, I, I want to continue with where I'm going with this. Okay. Uh, I, and that is hearkening on but she arose before anyone could recognize another. And the reason why I see this as, um, as a, uh, another deep rapture connection, besides the obvious about arising, right? Uh, or rising up, right? And just how you're gonna look at this. Now in the uh, Amplified Bible, they, they say, but got up before anyone could recognize another, okay? But King James, and I think they got it right in this particular uh, instance, it says she arose. And, and just so you know, I've done, I've got a copy of the Greek from the Septuagint, right? Uh, that translates it here. I want you to take a snapshot so you can see. Okay, whoops, there we go. Okay, all right. So in Ruth 3.14, and then I want to highlight, it says, so she lay at his feet until morning and she arose. And now the word there is uh, v'takam, right? That's takam, and she arose. And what I thought was very interesting when I looked at this, I saw yet another connection. I said, it shows occurrences, seven of 17. And I went, 717, 717. Wait a minute, let's look that up in Strong's. And why? Just because I can't get enough of the rapture of the bride, right? And so I look up in Strong's and I'm thinking to myself, Wait a minute. What is that? What is that? So 
I looked it up in Strong 717. And just so you can see here, right? All right. This is what it says. Strong's definition, to gather, to pluck. The NAS exhaustive concordance, to gather, to pluck. And then we got down at Brown, Driver, and Briggs, verb, pluck, or gather. And then they give several references. And the one that's right under that, it's list Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, okay. So I, I go there, and there's another connection. And I went and looked up Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and this is what I've, I'm seeing more rapture connections. Let me just show you what I highlighted here out of this one translation, okay? Right? All right. And this is out of the English Standard Edition, but I'm going to read you several of these because I think this is a very, very interesting connection here. So in this particular one, it says, you notice how it says on the side, he. So he is saying this. He. Who is the he? This is the bridegroom. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Then it says others that say, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. All right. So I thought that... Uh, I, I actually just went a little farther and I, and I just thought, wait a minute, let's continue on. The bride searches for her beloved. She says in uh, uh, two, I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew my locks with the drops of the night. And so here's what I, I, I just, and I'm thinking like, wait a minute, there's, there's the, a sound, a sound is heard, right? And she knows it's her beloved and he is saying, open to me. I thought, wow, wait a minute. But let's focus then on uh, verse one. Uh, we're going to uh, focus on uh, verse one here a little bit more. And I've got this whole thing because I'm going to read several of these because I really want you to get this connection here. Uh, and this is actually out of a devotional from uh, a person named Tanya Slim in Growing with God. So I'm going to give her credit out of this, uh, of course. And she lists several of these things and, and, and intersperses it with uh, different, uh, different messages, okay? So I'm going to just go through this and be able to read these so that you can glean some excellent uh, information out of this. And this is, again, out of Song of Solomon 5, verse 1. Uh, this is out of the King James, right? So I'm not leaving that out, folks. So... Uh, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. So they have it there such as it's just the bridegroom saying everything, Okay. Uh, I, I, and I think what you're going to see is several different approaches from this, uh, the he and uh, or the man or the bridegroom 
and uh, friends or others or whatever, or maybe they just don't believe that anyone else is saying this, okay? All right, so out of the NIV, it says like this, he who says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride, I have gathered my myrrh with my spice, I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey, I have drunk my wine and my milk, but then they have the friends which say, eat friends and drink, drink your fill of love. How about the message Bible starts with the man. I went to my garden, dear friend, best lover, breathe the sweet fragrance. I ate the fruit and honey. I drank the nectar and wine. Celebrate with me, friends. Raise your glasses to life, to love. That's a, a bit far afield as far as okay, they might kind of catch the intent, but I, I just don't see that. I try to be closer to the words than that, but just to put it here so you can kind of see. Uh, the bridegroom in the Amplified Bible, I have come to my garden, my sister, my promised bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam and spice from your sweet words. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and drink deeply, O oh lovers. In our poem, time has passed. We find a shift in the story. We must understand that in ancient times, weddings would last for several days, seven days or longer. Even after the happy couple had consummated their marriage, folks would still be there to help them celebrate the marriage. The knowledge of our union with Christ gives us confidence in prayer. It's when Jesus had begun to expound the closeness of this union that he also began to introduce the disciples to the true heart of prayer. If Christ abides in us and we abide in him, we're going to cover that more later too, and his words dwell in us and we pray in his name that God hears us, John 15 verses 4 through 7. But all of these expressions are simply extensions of the one fundamental idea. If I am united with Christ, then all that is his is mine. So long as my heart, will, and mind are one with Christ in his words, I can approach God with the humble confidence that my prayers will be heard and answered. That's from Sinclair B. Ferguson, right? Very interesting. Here we go again. The Voice Bible says, him to her. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with its natural spices. I have tasted the honeycomb dripping with my honey. I have drunk my wine and milk together to his young friends of Jerusalem. Eat, friends, drink your fill, be intoxicated with love. The marriage has been consummated and our groom has been satisfied, even blessed with the experience. It is interesting to note how many times the word my is repeated in this passage. Most translations, it is nine times. Earlier in the poem, we find him using the pronoun you and yours, but now he has accepted the gift of his bride. He has entered the garden. He has accepted his bride, this new member of his family. He has gathered her spices unto himself, tasted of her honeycomb, drunk of her milk and wine, and he has been satisfied. Amen. Amen. That's the consummation. That is the drawing. That is, the, oh my goodness. Now we find him encouraging friends and family to celebrate with them, for love is indeed good. How about uh, the Living Bible? King Solomon, I am here in my garden, my darling, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spices and eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. The young women of Jerusalem, oh, lover and beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply. 
What we can take away from this passage is the love, joy, and satisfaction found in the union of the two lovers. When the two became one, as they do in marriage, they were joined and united. Now they have the privilege of enjoying one another completely, and we find that the groom has found complete satisfaction. Amen. As we continue our study, we will find that the bride does as well. So what does union with Christ mean? It means that we are joined together and united with him. We are part of his family. He is ours and we are his. It means that we have begun a new life. Paul told the Corinthians this, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person. He is not the same anymore. A new life has become uh, begun. That's in 2 Corinthians 5.17 in the Living Bible. Uh, we will gain a deeper understanding of our bridegroom. Out of the Amplified Bible, we have, but it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, revealing his plan of salvation and righteousness, making us acceptable to God and sanctification, making us holy and setting us apart for God and redemption, providing our ransom from the penalty of sin. So then, as it is written in scripture, he who boasts and glories, let him boast and glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 through 31. We will be unified with Christ, becoming one heart and mind with him. Oh, I so look forward to that. I so look forward to that. Out of the Message Bible, in John 17, verses 20 through 23, it says, I'm praying not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me because of them and their witness about me. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so they might become one heart and mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I give them. So they'll be as unified and together as we are in them and you and me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and loved them in the same way that you've loved me. The Bible has much, much more to teach about being in union with Christ. We've only just scratched the surface, and that's all we're going to be able to do today. Uh, let's see. Uh, R. Allen Woods quotes, There are no shortcuts to maturity in discipleship. It was, is, and always will be learned over time and under pressure walking in union with Christ. And we see that. Uh, let's see. I, I'm going to end on uh, that. I, 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 my goodness, union with Christ. That's the marriage. That's what it's all about. And you see how we got to that again from one verse in Ruth. Uh, okay. Are we finished with Ruth yet? Not exactly. There's one more thing that I want to discuss, and that is Ruth chapter 3, verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had told her. Uh, I, I, I find this very interesting. Why did she go down to the threshing floor? What, what, what is that meaning to us? What, what are we really seeing in that? She went down, and it says it uh, later on, right, that, uh, that she went to lie, uh, lie down. She went down, uh, and uh, let's see, where's another one here? Uh, ah, yeah, in uh, 3, verse 3. So wash and anoint yourself with olive oil and then put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. All right. I, I think that that's very interesting. The, the word uh, 
and, and did it say that? Does it, does it really say went down? And so I looked it up. Of course, I go on the interlinear again so I can see the, the Greek translation. And here, let's see if I can get you to where you can see it. Okay. And so here what we can see is, yes, it does. Uh, so she went down. And we see that is the word vat taret. She, so she went down, went down. And that just made me think once again about the Jordan, right? What does the Jordan mean? That means descent, go down. Now, let's, let's talk for just a second about the Jordan. The Jordan starts, at, it's a river that starts at the base of Mount Hermon and goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. It goes all the way down. And I find it very interesting, of course, that uh, uh, that in 2 Kings chapter 2, where we have Elijah, again, he's going through several different places. And they, the last place that he goes before he's taken, it says that they uh, go, uh, what, what, where is it? Is it Jericho? I can't remember just exactly where this is. Uh, across the Jordan. And uh, so I'm just going to, let's see, can I do that? I don't want to do it or look it up. But that, the, the whole point is that I'm saying is that there's a crossing of the Jordan. There's a descent before there is a raising that tends to come up afterwards. And, um, and, and I see that as, as being very interesting. You go down first, then you come up and you're drawn out. And we can see that very well in Ruth chapter three with those connections. Um, but I also then want to then go back and really highlight one more thing at, well, not one more thing. How about a couple more things out of Ruth three, verse 14. And, uh, and that is, uh, not verse 14. Let me see. Yes. Yeah, let's start at verse 14. And then, yeah, we're, we're going to look a little deeper at verse 14 and verse 15. Okay. All right. So again, verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning. Now, the very first thing that I thought about in that instance, of course, was uh, Mary and Martha. How Mary lays at the feet of Jesus or sits at the feet of Jesus, right? She's going to be at his feet. And yet we have another type and shadow of a rapture uh, and the raptured bride being Mary and the left behind church being Martha. Okay. And, and, and what we're going to do, I'm going to uh, discuss that a little more in detail. And so how, you know, how do you get that Wayne? How do you see that? Okay. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 10 verses 38 through 42. Now, I'm going to read this from the King James Version, and then we're going to highlight yet even more connections, okay? All right, starting at verse 38, Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, we're going to get into that deeper. Highlight that, which also sat at Jesus' feet. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she should have me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. 
But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. All right, so let's let me highlight a couple of things out of this. Uh, we're going to dig deep into this particular point here, and there's a couple of things that I want to highlight in out of this, uh, and that is a a couple of things. We're going to get into it deeper, but I just just to kind of tickle uh, the the tummy just a little bit, perk you up, and say, "All right, this is interesting." Verse thirty nine. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Okay? Now, that's what it has in the King James Version, but the interesting thing is it doesn't have that in, uh, in, in some other versions. They have it as listening to uh, his word or that type of thing. But I think that when you look it up in the Greek, uh, uh, while it can be listening to, I think that the implication here is that it is, um, it is heard. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to tell you why I see that and where I see another connection here. So, well, let me just tell you about the connection heard his word. Hmm. That made me think of he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. There's another connection there. You have to hear his word, right? When you hear and understand, then that's, that's what you're going to get. So Mary has heard his word. She's not just listening she actually heard, she understood, right? But here's another part. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus's feet. So there's something very interesting about the also. Some translations do not have that word also there. However, in the Greek, we're going to see, there's Luke chapter 10. You see it right there, the word chi. And that is the word also. That's interesting. What does that mean? Okay. Well, what that means is, let's just talk about this uh, a little bit more. I've got this uh, other excerpt from faithword.org and from a, a person named Michelle Christie. Okay. And I'm going to read uh, a part of this. And it's going to discuss Mary and Martha in the Bible at, at a deeper level. I think this is really going to, uh, to help. It says, hold on, wet the whistle. Thank you, Abba. All right. In our text, we find Jesus headed two miles east from Jerusalem toward the nearby village of Bethany. Jesus stops in Bethany where his friends Martha and Mary and their brother, Lazarus, live. John's gospel tells us that Jesus, quote, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, John 11, 5. One commentator indicates that Mary and Martha may have been the most important and prominent women in Jesus's life after his own mother. If we consider the passage and its canonical order, we first meet Jesus' friends here in Luke and later in John 11 and 12. Mary positions herself at the feet of Jesus in each of these stories. Very interesting. Luke says, excuse me, Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Now, that's another uh, version. That's what we're saying. King James says, heard. I think you need to highlight that. John 11 says that she falls at Jesus' feet. Mary anoints and wipes the feet of Jesus in John 12. The connection between Mary and Jesus' feet is significant. As Mary sits at Jesus' feet, Martha finds herself 
distracted by her many tasks. That's Luke 10, verse 40. Consumed by worry and anxiety, Martha demands that Jesus tell Mary to help her. Feeling justified, Martha receives an answer from Jesus she surely did not anticipate. Jesus commends Mary for sitting at his feet, inviting Martha to consider the way in which she serves. Digging deeper, the significance of Mary at the feet of Jesus. Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying or heard his word, right? Without understanding the cultural context, we might miss the profundity of Mary's posture. In Jewish tradition, sitting at the feet was what a disciple did. In Acts 22, verse 3, the Apostle Paul tells us that he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, an esteemed rabbi in Israel, trained Paul, who later would self-describe as a Pharisee of Pharisees in Acts 23, 6, cross with Philippians 3, 5. Mary sits at the feet of her rabbi, Jesus. Since this was the posture assumed by a disciple, we can safely conclude that Mary was a disciple of Jesus. So learning from both Mary and Martha. At first glance, we might assume that this story invites us to be either a Mary or a Martha. We ask, does a disciple sit at Jesus' feet or serve? While this might seem like the main point of the passage is make, making a clue to a deeper meaning may lie in a small word in verse 39 that is often left out of the translation, the Greek word chi, translated into English as also, which I showed you just a moment ago. A more literal word-for-word -word translation would read like this. And she had a sister called Mary, who also, having sat at the feet of the Lord, was listening or heard his word. We, uh, what might also be referring to here? We might consider it to mean that Mary also served. Or perhaps the word communicates that Martha also, just like her sister, Mary, sat at Jesus' feet. This could mean that in general, they both sat at Jesus' feet when he came around, but this time it was only Mary. Either way, Jesus does not condemn Martha, nor does he fit the sisters against each other. Jesus seizes a teachable discipleship moment, and I think that's really good. Disciples are not called to either sit or serve, but are called to both sit and serve. And I think that's just one of the things is just what is your priority? What is your priority, brothers and sisters? It's not either or. It's not. It's so when, when we hear things about, you know, what are you looking around at and, and, and uh, trying to find out about the rapture or the bride? Why don't you get out there and work? That sounds exactly like a Martha, right? Uh, no. What you want to do is you want to draw to Jesus first and then do what Jesus tells you to do. That's what you want to do. You don't want to take this on your own and then, okay, this is what I'm going to do. That's doing it apart from Jesus. You don't want to do anything apart from Jesus. Why? Because Jesus tells us in his word that apart from him, you can do nothing. All right? Martha's distraction... Uh, Hold on. Was uh, this distracted state Martha's characteristic way of serving? Perhaps, given Jesus' pointed answer to her demand, the word distracted means to be drawn away. Ding, 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 ding. Driven about mentally, overoccupied. Very literally, it means to be pulled and dragged in different directions. Martha's distraction leads to a sense of aloneness and self-righteousness to self-focus and questions about Jesus's care. Ooh, yes. Martha's distraction leads to five Ds, the letter D, okay? First D, 
disbelief. Martha asks, do you not care? Ooh. Defensiveness. Martha defends her place. My sister has left me to serve alone. Dismissiveness. Martha depersonalizes Mary as my sister, as though Mary is not even there. Demands. Martha flat out says to Jesus, tell her to help me. Desperation. Martha attempts to control the situation and Jesus with her comment about being alone. Martha's distracted serving led her to a place she did not want to go. Martha surely regrets the way she speaks to Jesus. We hear him lovingly acknowledge the state of her heart with when tender repetition, Jesus says, Martha, Martha. Jesus invites her to consider a way of serving that is without distraction and self-righteousness. Amen. In Martha's mind, she seems to have no choice but to serve alone with much worry. Jesus reminds her that she does not, she actually does have a choice. Martha can spend time doing the one needed and necessary thing from which all else flows. She is called and we are called. Jesus did not acquiesce to Mary's sitting at his feet. He uh, unequivocally applauds it. Jesus affirms Mary as his disciple, as well as her choice to abide with him. Jesus declares that one thing is needed as his disciple, a kind of attentiveness to Jesus that glories in his presence, a serving that bears eternal fruit. Not long after visiting Mary uh, and Martha, Jesus uses a vine as a teaching metaphor in John 15. As he walks through the grapevines of the Kidron Valley, Jesus emphatically endorses a choice like Mary's. He instructs his disciples how to live without his physical presence. The key, he says, is abiding in him and allowing his words to abide in them. For apart from Jesus, they will not be able to do anything of kingdom value. It is to the Father's glory that they bear much fruit. Mary models that fruit will not be born apart from remaining in Jesus. Amen. And so this is a, another interesting kind of connection there, both from a discipleship standpoint, as well as from a rapture and a left behind standpoint. Who is Jesus coming to rapture as his bride? It's going to be the Marys. It's going to be the Marys. It's not going to be the ones that are distracted with the world. It's not going to be the ones focused and self-righteous in their serving apart from Jesus. He's coming for those that are sitting at his feet, looking up. Think about this. In order to sit at someone's feet, to look at, you have to look up, right? And doesn't, doesn't, aren't we told that when these things in Luke, uh, when these things begin to come to pass, the things that are happening on this world, the things that Martha is distracted by, doesn't he say to look up and lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near? That's what he says, right? Okay. Let's, uh, let's take a look at, a, at another uh, couple of things here. And so I like that. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, so why don't we consider that Martha also sat at Jesus' feet? There were times that she did that. He, she was also a disciple of Jesus. She was also part of the family, right? That, that's the interesting thing about this. But 
she was distracted by the world. And if you are going to be distracted by the world, you, oh, I, I, I just have a hard time with this. I just, I cut, you know, it's a little cringe worthy when you think about it. And, it, and you go, that's like, tell her to come help me. And he's like, ooh, you just said that to Jesus? <laughs> oh my God. And, uh, and I'm like, no, don't do that. So, <laughs> uh, but how often is that the case, you know? It's not that, uh, how many of us are actually like that? I, I, I've done that, everybody's done that, but you just do not wanna do that. This is not the time to do that. It's not the time to be going off and doing things. So here's, here's one of the things that, that I look at here. I have this channel and I love to be able to get into the deeper meaning of the word, but always be looking at our soon coming for Jesus, for his bride. That's that, Those are two things that the most important is being with Jesus. The most important is looking for him, looking for him, receiving from him, being with him, loving on him, worshiping him, lifting him up, praising him. Do you understand? That's the most important thing. And when you do that, when you abide with Jesus, then he bears fruit, that you bear the fruit. He creates the fruit. You don't create the fruit. And see, you see, that's one of the things through you, the fruit is created, you bear the fruit, right? Do you, do you understand how that works? And uh, and I'm just saying, this is not the time to be distracted by your serving. God knows how and where to place you. The word also says that he has prepared works beforehand for you to walk in them. So you don't have to go out looking for things, right? He will impress upon you. He will tell you, show you what you should do. And I, I, I think that that is so important. Keep that in mind, especially now, especially now, okay? But are we finished? No. Let's tie Ruth chapter 3 to one more thing, okay? And then we will call it a day. All right. So we went through verse 14, and then he goes on in verse 15 and says, he also said, give me the shawl that you are wearing and hold it out. So Ruth held it and he measured out six measures of barley into it and placed it on her. And she went into the city. First off, what do you use the barley for? To make bread. And where is she going? She's going into the city with it, right? She is bringing food. She's bringing food into the city. I find this very interesting. So she's bringing it to her mother, Naomi. And here's one of the things. So Naomi is representative of, I believe, Israel. Uh, and, and so she's bringing this food back to feed her in the city. What's the city? The city is Bethlehem, the house of bread, okay? Now, one of the things that I want to get at, and here's another, I believe, rapture connection, and it is that, because the six measures of barley measured out caused me to immediately think about the wedding at Cana, all right? And follow me for a minute. We're going to read that. That happened in John chapter 2, okay? And I'm going to read the first 10 verses of John chapter 2 out of the King James Version. And this is what it says, starting at verse 1. And the third day, hmm, interesting, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called 
and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. And Jesus uh, said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, wow, something happened here. What, what happened? Where did this come from? Ooh. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. I hope that you can see the connection between the six measures of barley and the six water pots, okay? And, and here is what we have. We, we have the, the uh, uh, water. What is the water considered? Well, we have the water is considered the word, right? And, uh, and what's interesting here is that uh, there's six measures of barley in Ruth's shawl. This thing was filled up. We're not talking about a cup full, okay? He loaded her up. This whole shawl is filled up with this for her to, to take back. Six measures. That's as much as she can take, right? And so here we see this uh, six water pots. They are filled to the brim, right? And so we have that taken out. But I want you to point out, just as we pointed out earlier, that marriages last the Galilean wedding, well, here we have one. They lasted for a week. But what's interesting here is that the wedding had already occurred, right? We, we see that in verse 9, that when the ruler of the face tasted the water was turned wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants drew out the water. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, right? You are the bridegroom when you have your bride. So here is something that's happened. The bride has already joined with the bridegroom. Do you see? And so that means that the union, the marriage has already taken place. And that is what we see once again. We, we see more rapture connections, more connections here. And I'm hoping that you can see that as well. Uh, do not let it be known, verse 14 uh, out of uh, Ruth 3, once again, that the woman came to the threshing floor last night. Okay, that's, that's what we're going to say. Who is the woman? That is the bride of Christ. That is the one who came to the Redeemer. She came to the Redeemer, not him coming to her. And, and, and there's, there's so much more that we could see here. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that I believe there are so many connections, so many things taking place right now that we can't help but know in our very being, our very heart of hearts, that Jesus is about to call up his bride. I love you, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged now. Everything that's happening in the world is pointing to this in so many ways. 
the resurrection earthquake that just took place after the, you know, at, at, at the same time that the uh, uh, rapture is taking place in the dreams that I had. That's what's, all of this is fitting together. It is that time. And let's look up. Let's lift up our heads, as it says in Luke. Let's also, in Luke 21, verse 36, where it says, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming upon the earth, and to stand before the Son of Man. That's the marriage. That's the marriage. I pray that you will continue to pray that as well. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, what are you waiting for? There is no one that loves you anywhere in this world, in all creation, more than Jesus, the Son of God, God, a very God. That is who Jesus is. And he loves you and wants you to be part of the family. And how do you do that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, gives us a simple, small uh, 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 snippet of what the gospel is. That's the good news. And that's the good news that Jesus, as God, he came and was born in the flesh, that he was crucified on the cross for our sin debt, everyone's sin debt that we cannot pay for. He was buried in the grave, and after three days, he rose again to life. And if you will trust in that completely, he says, Jesus says, if you will believe in that, believe in him, trust in him, believe that everything that he has said is true, then you can ask for him to cleanse you. You can ask for him to save you and he will do it. He will do it. He has promised to do that. He has promised to do that. You don't have to do anything first. Don't wait to try to clean yourself up. Don't wait for anything. Just right now, wherever you are, say, yes, I believe you, Jesus. I trust that you died for my sin debt to pay for it because I can't. I ask you to cleanse me. I, I ask you, I thank you that you arose again after three days. And I thank you that you offer me this free gift of salvation and I accept, come into my heart, cleanse me, cover me with your precious blood right now, your cleansing blood, forgive me of my sins, save me, Lord Jesus, and call me up to be with you. And if you have prayed that, I hope that you have. I want to welcome you to the family right now. What an eternally awesome decision you have made. I love you, brothers and sisters. I want to see you new family members. Go out and tell someone that you have done this. And brothers and sisters, let's look up. Our redemption is drawing near. Maranatha, God bless you all.